goedenavond. Welkom bij de allereerste aflevering in het nieuwe seizoen van College Tour. Onze gast vanavond die is wereldberoemd. Ze behoort tot een van de tien meest invloedrijke vrouwen ter wereld. En als jong meisje begon ze in de jaren zestig met het onderzoek naar chimpansees in het wild. In Gombe Park in Tanzania. En ze deed baanbrekende ontdekkingen. Nu is ze 81 jaar oud. Ze reist 300 dagen per jaar. En haar werk is nog steeds zeer invloedrijk. Ze is onvermoeibaar en ze strijdt voor het behoud van chimpansees in de vrije natuur. Samen met 300 studenten hier in de Koningszaal in Artis interview ik primatologe Jane Goodall. We are packed here. We have way more people in the hall than uh, the fire people allow us, but uh, it's so busy. Everybody wanted to talk to you. Well, let's hope the fire people don't come. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> watching already, I think. <laughs> Let me ask you the, the, always the first openings question in this show, College Tour, is uh, what kind of student were you? Um, well, I wasn't. I never went to college. See, so I was a peculiar student. I got permission to do a PhD at Cambridge the eighth in their history, without a previous degree. And when I was a PhD student, I really didn't interact much. I just sat in my room and wrote and wrote and wrote, because in England, you don't have to do coursework. You write your thesis. Did you miss it in your work no. when you started out? No. So you're telling these students it's absolutely unnecessary no. to go to university? No, I'm not telling them anything <laughs> of the sort, because now it's different. Why? Because when I began studying chimpanzees, nobody was studying chimpanzees. There was nothing to learn. You were born in 1934. Mm -hmm. Your dad was in the war. Mm -hmm. um, and your parents uh, divorced, right, after the war? Yeah. Now, your mom, was she, is she enthusiastic about your work in uh, She in was Africa? enthusiastic about her two daughters doing what they wanted to do. And she encouraged us at a time when everybody, I mean, at school, what was they the laughed lesson? at me. They laughed at me. Why? Because going out into Africa and living with animals and studying them and writing books, people don't do that. You're crazy. But she didn't say that. What, was what she said to me, I would say to every single student here, if you really want to do something, you have to work really hard, take advantage of opportunities, and never give up. How important was your mother? in this career? Super important. What is the single most important lesson that, that she gave you? Um, courage of my convictions, courage to believe in myself, but always questioning myself first. Yeah. Oh, you, you think you're right. Then when you started this work, you were, as you are still today, you were looking very good, you were good at what you did, and, and you looked very good, and the National Geographic, the famous uh, nature magazine, put you on the cover of the magazine. And I understood that some of your colleagues said, well, Jane Goodall, you know, she's only good for to be the cover girl of National yeah. Geographic. Is that right? They did say that. Yeah, that all I had going for me were my legs. <laughs> the reason they took me. See, Louis Leakey offered me the opportunity. Can you explain to us, Louis Leakey, what, what his role was yeah, in your Lewis, career? Yeah, Louis Leakey, uh, the, the paleontologist who spent his life searching for the fossilized remains of early man. And he wanted, he had a feeling that if we could learn about our closest living relatives, it would help him to better understand how early man might have behaved. Mm -hmm. So his, his reasoning was, Jane, if you find behavior that's the same or similar uh, in chimps today as humans today, possibly that was present in the common ancestor six to eight million years ago. So Louis Leakey puts you on the path of what you became in the end, and then, like you have the movie Charlie's Angels, there were three women, and one of them was you, who were called Leakey's Angels. Yeah. Who was there except Jane Goodall? Well, there was Diane Fossey and Baruti Galdikas. And, and he... Baruti did orangutans, and Diane Fossey did, 
did uh, gorillas. And if he'd known about bonobo, but they were called pygmy chimps, then he would have had somebody out there too. Bonobo, the love ape. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what, was, what was his vision to ask the three of you to study these different apes? Well, the vision to was to learn about early man and evolution. Mm. Women, because he just felt women made better observers. Why? Personally, I think the reason why women do make good observers in animal behavior is because it's being a good mother, you have to be patient. Um, it's no good bullying and yelling and screaming at your children. Uh, you have to be quick to understand the needs and wants of a creature before it can speak. And so those things, I think, help you sort of, Observe. you know, if any of it is inborn in us. So you're not surprised that um, the majority of students here today are girls and women? Yeah, I've noticed that. But I will say to the boys, there are some fantastic male primate observers. OK. <laughs> Let's have a look before we open up the hall for questions of the students to um, the three women that Louis Leakey selected to do this investigation. And one of them, as you said, is Diane Fossey. And there was a very bad ending to her life. Let's yeah. have a look. I have a feeling that Louis Leakey was constantly approached by people who wanted help. Um, I asked him to help me uh, with my orangutan study. And uh, he had been looking for somebody to study orangutans. So in a funny kind of way, I walked into his life. He was expecting me. Another of Dr. Leakey's protégés, Jane Goodall, was working at the same time with chimpanzees in Tanzania. In 1967, Diane set up base in the Congo, but within months, civil war forced her to relocate to Rwanda. I decided to establish my study camp at the altitude of 10,000 feet, as far away from human encroachment as I could get it, and yet close enough to one of the mountains on which I found a substantial number of gorillas. Because of her anti-poaching tactics, the Rwandan government threatened to shut down her research study. Then, on December 26th, late at night, an unknown intruder entered Diane's cabin and attacked her with a machete. Her body was found the next morning. Diane was buried at her Karasoki camp. A gravestone marks the spot. Did you have a lot of contact with her? Mm. Yeah? Yeah. And I begged her to have a different attitude to the people around her. You know, because she said, well, I can't let any of, of um, the Africans she called them wogs, I'm afraid. Uh, I can't let them near the gorillas because then the gorillas, if they get used to them, will be more susceptible to poachers. And I said to her, but Diane, you're always telling me your gorillas are as intelligent as my chimps. My chimps, we have field staff from the surrounding villages following them, learning about them, talking about them. Nobody would poach a chimp from the villages around. Uh, and, and I said, if, if our Africans are following the chimps and we come across a strange fisherman, the chimps hide. So your gorillas would know the difference too. And if your guys, instead of just tracking them and never seeing them, got to understand them and see how wonderful they are, they would spread that. Because they weren't really making much money out of poaching mm. gorillas. So her distrust of the local yeah. people uh, led eventually to, to, to death, what happened I to her? I think so, yeah. yeah. It was really tragic. I really tried. But questions here. Please, if you have a question, stand up and the microphone will come to you. While you were observing chimp chimpanzees in Gombe, you started to give names to these anim animals. What were your arguments to do this, considering the field of biology uh, this was, and probably still is, uh, projecting, projecting an anthropomorphic view towards your research? Well, first of all, remember, I'd never been to college. I had no idea that people didn't give animals names. I had animals all my life. They all had names. I'll bet you everybody in here who's had an animal has given it a name. I used to give names to some of the birds and squirrels in the garden. Mm -hmm. I didn't even dream, how would, you, how would you remember a number? I couldn't remember if this is 21 or 37. There's no way I could do it. No, and fortunately, not all 
ethologists were quite as pig-headed and stupid. And today, more and more and more ethologists are using names. Thank you. Interestingly enough, um, here in this zoo where we are in Artis, uh, the director just decided we have to stop giving names to the animals in the zoo. Yeah, you know why? Tell me. It's usually because if an animal dies or disappears, the zoo doesn't want to be blamed. If they want to swap an animal with another zoo, they don't want the public saying, but we love Jerry, please bring Jerry back. Mm -hmm. But so the keepers will all have names for them. They still have names of for them. Of course they do. Yeah. I think, it's, I think they should have names, they're individuals. And that's been my fight from the beginning. Every animal has an individuality just like every human being. And without a name, the individuality kind of fizzles away. Right, so you're saying to the director of Artis, give them names. Yes, I would, I've said that to all of them. Let's have a look, this is the director of Artis. Uh, we talked to him briefly. We are very bang that if dieren give dieren allemaal a name, dat het gaat overheersen, hè? het toekennen van uh, menselijke eigenschappen, menselijke beweegredenen, uh, is natuurlijk niet goed voor dieren, want het zijn dieren. En het worden heel snel huisdieren of troeteldieren. We maken het helemaal als mensen, terwijl we die dieren niet in hun, uh, in hun respect laten, als het ware. I wish he was here, I could talk to him. <laughs> is he here? Does anybody know? If the, is the director Heek Balian here? No, he's not here. No, he wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what would you say to him if he were here? Well, I would just have a discussion about mm. the fact that each animal has a very distinct personality. And I can't think of another way than a name to, to encapsulate that, that personality. Yeah. I just heard that he will be here after the show to greet you, so okay. now we well, know then, what you are going to yes, say to him. <laughs> we'll have a dis heated discussion about names. Perfect. And the names will come back in Achters, I'm sure. No, they won't. No? Mm -hmm. mm. I'm a woman. <laughs> so? So he wouldn't give in, I'm sure. That uh, sounds to me like an old-fashioned statement. Like I know, but it's true. Still? I think so. You're convinced that if a woman says something to a man that uh, the man disagrees... No, not always, not always, not always. But in something like this, it would be so in England anyway. Maybe not in Holland. <laughs> hmm. I'm, I'm wondering here, because we have so many women students in the hall, uh, raise your hand if you totally agree with uh, Jane that it's difficult for a woman to make her point and men don't listen, yeah? Okay, then... Well, I would say in some points, in certain points, you definitely have the feeling and get the feeling that um, males would agree more with another male than with you if you have the f uh, same point. Have you got any good tricks to convince us as a sex? Oh, I've got all kinds of tricks up my sleeves. <laughs> okay. And uh, from the way you say it, it's not, not wise to instruct me what you are going to do not, as a trick. Not in public. No, no, not in public. <laughs> Okay, so anybody who wants to have advice of the women in the hall here, talk to Jane later. Questions, please stand up and ask your question. Um, yeah. I was wondering what kind of influence tourism has on the conservation of these chimps and gorillas? Well, I think tourism is very important. The big problem is it tends to get out of hand. Some tourism is really good. People come back, they tell their stories, they, they sort of spread the knowledge of how exciting it all is and how wonderful the animals are. But it's very, very hard to keep it, to keep it on the straight and level. Is it like the disnification of the jungle, of it's wildlife? It's sort of like that. It can be. It doesn't have to be. Hmm. You know, and there are some safari companies that do it really well. What about trophy hunting? Trophy hmm. hunting today, I, I don't think it's, it's something that shouldn't be done. How, how, do you, how do you, if you have a community of Africans who are poaching because they've always killed and eaten bushmeat, and you tell them not to do it, and then some rich American comes out, and he's allowed to go and shoot an elephant, he can shoot a warthog, he can shoot anything he likes, because he has money, well then why shouldn't they? And then maybe they'd get money too. Yeah. Uh, we have some of the examples of this, of um, trophy hunting, and also, to my surprise, I didn't notice, the children of one of the presidential candidates in the US are doing it as well. Have a look. There's a lot of Americans. <laughs> Thank you. 
Folks, after we heard that death moan, we knew it was over with. This was the hunt of a lifetime. Bob, <laughs> that's the most exciting thing I've done all day, buddy. <laughs> all day. <laughs> There's been widespread condemnations we've been reporting this morning of an American dentist who shot and killed a lion in Zimbabwe. It's made most of the front pages of the newspapers here today. Yes, it appears that Walter Palmer paid £35,000 to go on the hunt. The animal, known as Cecil, was shot with a bow and arrow. Other details emerging as well include claims that the lion took 40 hours to die. Donald Trump's son, under fire, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump are sparking some major outrage tonight over hideous pictures that emerged of the two of them on a big game hunt in Africa. They are posing in front of slain wild animals and people are naturally outraged. Animal rights groups are saying this is disgusting. Agreed. It's disgusting. Mm. I mean, when you know, as I know, that animals are individuals, even if they're wild and even if we don't know them, they have, a, they have their own life. Why should we go and shoot them? Shooting of there was a civet just now, mm -hmm. unbelievable. And it has nothing to do with uh, wildlife preservation. No, nothing. Well, they say so because they say they give money, but the money very, very rarely, I'm told, goes actually to save the animals. Yeah. There are many enemies of your work, and one of them is overpopulation. So what you see oh, here, yeah. this is the current world population. It's yes, growing. And and if you if you watch for a second. Uh, the planet is, uh, humanity is growing mm. in an unbelievable mm. number if you mm. see it here. Is yeah. this the enemy of what you are trying to do? I think there are three enemies. This is definitely one of them. Another one is extreme poverty, because when you live in extreme poverty, if it's in the wilderness areas, you cut the trees down because you have to, you've got to live, you've got to support your family. Mm. If you're in a city, you buy the cheapest stuff, which has obviously been made by destroying the environment mm. normally. And then the third is the opulent lifestyle of the rest of us. That's us in the West? Yes. What are we doing wrong? Well, we, don't we all have far more than we need? Far more than we need. And I'm not saying everybody's got to change their lifestyle, because that's, that's wrong. We've worked hard to get to this level. But you can think about waste, and people are beginning to think about waste. What? And sharing your wealth when you get wealth, and people, I mean the people I know, all sharing their wealth. Um, you have a Dutch connection. There are actually some, there's more than one connection to the Netherlands. You were um, married to a Dutchman, and you are staying, as I was told uh, tonight, in the house of a Dutch friend. Yes, that's who, right. Yes. He's back there. He's back there, yeah. Somewhere. Whom we talked to for a little clip about your life. Let's have a look. As klein meisje is Jane opgegroeid in, in het huis de Birches. Ik ben er ook uh, een paar keer uh, geweest. Het uh, is een groot huis in een prachtige tuin. En het is in die tijd ook dat uh, Jane haar passie voor dieren ontwikkelt. Als Jane s'morgens zoek is, uh, dan uh, blijkt ze later in het kippenhok gezeten te hebben. Om te gaan ervaren, waar komen die eieren nou vandaan? Nou, dat is een voorbeeld, prachtig voorbeeld van haar nieuwsgierigheid. Ik denk dat de rol van Jane's moeder Van essentieel geweest is in de hele vorming van Jane. Zij is de vrouw die haar het vertrouwen gegeven heeft om op pad te gaan, om die reis naar Afrika te maken... wat echt niet makkelijk is in de zestiger jaren... om je prachtige, slimme dochter zomaar naar Afrika te laten gaan. Jane is dus in Afrika en uh, dan komt daar die uh, filmer Hugo van Lawik... en er ontstaat een romance en uh, ze gaan met elkaar samenwerken... en uit de samenwerking en de liefde is een mooi kind geboren, dat is Grab. What I do remember is the noise of the chimps displaying outside and, uh, and, and, and some of the big male chimps jumping up onto the, onto the cage and displaying and, you know, shaking the cage. And those are terrifying moments, de definitely. I have Jane nog nooit horen spreken over stoppen. Jane heb ik wel horen spreken vele malen om het iets rustiger aan te doen, dus het tempo wat te verlagen. Maar elke keer weer, als ik er weer ontmoette, zei ze, ja, het is toch niet echt gelukt. 
Is he right? I mean, it's the most asked question to you. Where do you get the energy from and when are you going to retire? Well, I'll probably have to retire at some point unless I drop down dead because nobody can go on forever. I hope to go on writing as long as I can and, and teaching in a sort of way. And slowing down, well, again, I'll have to at some point. Because you hate traveling, right? I don't like traveling, no. But your, your life is in a plane. 300 days a year, I'm on the road. Any questions here? <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm currently observing the behavior of bonobos in zoos. And I'm trying to find ideas to make their life in captivity as comfortable as possible. Because, of course, I don't agree with them living in captivity. But I was wondering if you maybe have any ideas for me to make that happen. Before you answer the question, is it okay if we show the audience at home yep. uh, the bonobos? Because there was a Dutch primatologist uh, whom you know well, Frans de Waal, yes. who did extensive studies uh, into yep. the bonobos. So you will get an answer. First, let's have a look at uh, Frans de Waal, who was a guest on the show as well, by the yeah, way. I know. Regardless of the state of excitement, there's never any tension. As soon as conflict arises, they mutually calm one another. And some will even provoke their menfolk, just so they can get a bit of comfort. Bonobos hebben een enorm veel seksuele activiteit die te maken heeft met het handhaven van relaties. Dus bijvoorbeeld de eenvoudigste manier om seks te krijgen onder bonobos, en dus de, heel veel van die scènes waren in feite zo, is als je, voedsel in, als je ze voedsel geeft. Want voedsel introduceert meteen competitie, dat is zo bij heel veel soorten. En de competitie wordt meteen opgelost met seks. En dus als je voer geeft aan bonobos, dan krijg je meteen seksuele activiteit. Dus bonobos die hebben seks in alle combinaties. Iedereen doet het met iedereen en, en ze doen het in alle standjes die mogelijk zijn. <laughs> the bonobo. The Now sexy the, ape. Very sexy. The love ape. The, yeah, the love ape. Yeah. The, the answer to the question. The answer to the question is, um, it's the same for all of the intelligent animals in zoos. They tend to get bored. So I started a program called Chimpanzoo. And we now have a really good manual of ways of enriching the lives of captive animals. Mm -hmm. So even if the space for a chimp is not big enough, if you give them, you've got to give variation, you've got to give them tests. And when I first began making these things, the zoos didn't want them, the keepers couldn't be bothered. We're going back a long way now. A lot of my ideas go back a long way. And so, so basically, it was an orangutan who first demonstrated how good these were, because the chimp keepers wouldn't do it. And it was very simply a piece of wood like this with holes, diagonal holes drilled part way in with a grape or a raisin down each one. And the orangutan would leave all the food that had been put out on the ground in order to come and poke, which is how chimpanzees get palm nuts out. So we can lend you, we can give you a copy of that manual. It's yeah, a chimpanzee yeah. <laughs> chimpanzee manual. Yeah. That will be very useful, yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, we were talking to uh, Frans de Waal, we showed him al already, um, and we interviewed him briefly about your career. Let's have a look. Ja, haar aanpak was aanvankelijk om um, in, het, in het bos te proberen die chimpansees te vinden. En haar strategie was om de individuen te herkennen, ze namen te geven, ze te volgen over de tijd. In die tijd waren er zoveel taboes. Dieren hadden geen intenties, dieren hadden geen persoonlijkheid. En zij gooiden dat eigenlijk allemaal overboord en besprak de, de chimpansees alsof, alsof het collega's waren. Zo van, en die deed dit en toen deed die dat. En, en ze hadden persoonlijkheden en ze hadden voorkeuren en sommigen waren slimmer en anderen waren dommer enzovoort. En dat werd haar wel heel kwalijk genomen, maar dat was toch ook bevrijdend. Ik denk dat de eerste doorbraak was de ontdekking dat chimpansees werktuigen gebruiken om mieren en termieten te vangen. De andere was dat chimpansees veel gevaarlijker en agressiever waren dan we hadden gedacht. En dat ze ook elkaar soms aanvallen. Dat heeft heel lange tijd genomen voordat we wisten precies hoe dat werkte. En er was heel veel twijfel over, dat is eigenlijk nog controversieel in sommige kringen. Maar de chimpansees die maakten elkaar soms dood. En dat wordt vaak vergeleken met oorlog. Uh, som sommige mensen leggen dat uit, dat betekent dat de mens uh, altijd oorlog zal voeren, want het zit in onze genen. We zijn instinctmatig oorlogzuchtig, om het zo maar te zeggen. 
En dat vind ik een overdreven conclusie. Um, sometimes it said in evolution the chimpanzee went to the left, the war ape, and we followed the chimpanzee. And unfortunately we didn't go to the right, where the love ape is, the bonobo, because the world would have been a totally different place. I hope the population would have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> Oké, okay. ik dacht niet dat. Dus je zegt dat het een goed ding is dat we naar de. Serieus? Nee, ik denk dat we volgden. Ik bedoel, de manier waarop het lijkt te is dat we een common ancestor hadden. We hadden niet volgen, maar van dat common ancestor hadden we al die karakteristieken. En dus nemen we ze met ons en ontwikkelen ze in onze eigen manier. Onze kind of. En natuurlijk is onze warfare nu zo verschillend. Het is allemaal over geld. With Chimps' territory. Next one here. Hi, uh, I'm studying animal welfare and behavior, and I come from Vietnam. But it's really difficult to improve animal welfare in uh, my country because when I talk about it, people often say that why we have to care about animal welfare when we even have uh, don't have enough uh, human welfare or we have we suffer from hunger. So how do you? Well, answer? I mean, they're, they're probably right, aren't they? Yeah. And I can only answer you from my experience in Africa, which is because I knew the people were right, we then worked with the people. And so working with the people and improving their lives, then they were more prepared to help us with the animals. And that's how it's worked. So you have to do both at the same time? Mm. Yeah. Yes, I think so. And that's the solution. But I mean, you can't do both at the same time. But if you, you know, it's a question of collaboration, teaming up with people trying to get a group together to say, well, you know, if you can do that for these people, maybe those people will help us do this for these animals. Okay. But the situation with rhino horn is, is kind of ridiculous. It's even being used for hangovers, I'm told. Is that true? Uh, some, some way, yeah. Mm. yeah. What is exactly, for those who don't know, the situation with the rhinos? What is happening to them? Oh, they're going faster than elephants. Way faster. Almost extinct already? Yes, some of them, some of the species. And it's used for ridiculous treatments, medical treatments? And, and so. It's the same, yes. It's, it's not real. It's a bit of hair, it's nail. It's fingernail. Hmm. And, you know, they, it's supposed to be able to cure all kinds of diseases, they think. And it doesn't. Hi, um, I like to be a uh, conservationist, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but what would you say are the most important steps to take in order to become a conservationist? Well, there's, uh, there's so many different kinds of conservationists. You know, you could want to be forest, or you could want to be a certain animal, or whatever. So, first of all... Uh, well, for me, it would be uh, to conserve elephants. To conserve elephants? Yes. You couldn't have chosen a more difficult one, right? Yes, now. <laughs> I know, and so I am. I... You, you've got to learn exactly what's involved. To conserve elephants, you're not going to just have a lovely time out in the field with the elephants. You're going to have to learn about China. Yes. You're going to have to learn about the, the 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 whole trade thing. You're going to have to learn about the, you know, about the corruption and everything. So to be an elephant conservationist, that's really tough. So you'd say I maybe would choose another animal too. <laughs> I think it would probably be good to just not be too focused on elephants. Doesn't mean you can't think about them and try to help them and stuff. But think think in other terms as well. Yeah. Tackling well, conservation. Well, I'd like to combine it with veterinary medicine since oh. I'm also a vet student. Well, then if you want to do veterinary medicine. There's lots of ways that you can help conservation by helping conservationists, by looking after the animals that they're yes, trying to exactly. conserve. But it's probably not going to be elephants. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit. Much. Exactly. Yes. I was going to say. Never give in. Yeah, I was going to say because it, uh, something being difficult that didn't stop you from doing no. what you did in the no. 60s. And, that, and, um, I'm actually a bit surprised by your advice because no, you were. No, I told her. It will be first difficult. It's going to be difficult, yeah. and she needs to think about all those different aspects. Yes. And if you still want to do it, that's what I say. Good for you. <laughs> Don't give in, but learn, but think it through first. That's yes. all. Not give up. Um, we talked to one of the former prime ministers in the Netherlands. 
who was inspired by your work as well and who had a message for you. Let's have a look. Ja, mijn vriendschap en bewondering begint eigenlijk na mijn politieke periode dus. Den Haag. Zo ben ik bekend. Minister-president. En dan word ik gevraagd om hoge commissaris voor de vluchtelingen te worden. En ik doe dat op verzoek van uh, Kofi Annan. En daar komt eigenlijk Jane Goodall binnen. En zij komt naar mij in Genève. Wij praten. En ik word op de eerste dag, om het zo maar eens te zeggen, verliefd op haar verhaal. Wat kan iemand toch gemotiveerd zijn? Wat een wonder is het dat ik deze vrouw ontmoet die zo authentiek gaat voor haar eigen roeping en missie in het leven. Dus zij vertelt dat verhaal aan mij. Daar wordt, ontwikkelt zich de vriendschap met Jane Goodall. En dat krijgt dan een bijzondere draai. Want als ik de hoge commissaris van de vluchtelingen ben, dan hebben ze eruit gevogeld dat die actrice Angelina Jolie misschien wel een goede vluchtelingenambassadrice is. Dus die wordt naar Genève gevraagd. Ik praat met haar. En die blijkt heel gemotiveerd, dus dat was een goede greep. Maar er gebeurt iets heel merkwaardigs in dat gesprek. Want die zegt, meneer Lubbers, kent u Jane Goodall? Ik zeg, natuurlijk ken ik Jane Goodall, maar waarom vraag je dat aan Angelina? En dan zegt ze, ja, zij heeft mij eerlijk en ronduit. Ik ben zo'n fan van haar. Dat is mijn idool. Zou u dan kunnen regelen dat ik haar eens een keer kan spreken? Dear Jane, I'm so happy that you are available here for this college tour, my home country. And I remember the good days that we spoke so many times together. But here, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Rude, if you're listening, um, I remember those days so well. And thank you for that beautiful message and lots of love to you. I hope to meet you again soon. Uh, I'm Michael and I'm a FED student and I was wondering what's your opinion on the exhibition of uh, animal behavior as for primates in zoos because I want to work in a zoo and I want to know how I can interfere or improve animal welfare and ex exhibition of uh, animal behavior. Well I think again it's going back to what I said about enrichment, trying to find the ways that will amuse them, entertain yep. them which will actually demonstrate to people how intelligent they are, how smart they are, how canny they are, and it will enable them to use their inborn skills. So it works to help them. It also works to help the people. And as zookeepers are getting more you know, uh, educated and very different to the keepers I knew when I was young, who didn't care about the animals at all. Are you ambivalent about zoos? Bad zoos are very uh, not ambivalent at all. They shouldn't be. Uh, a good zoo, um, I, you know, I don't agree with people who say we should have no zoos. Most people, how will they ever see? They say to me, well, children, they can learn just as much from watching a, a movie. That's not true. When you're in front of an animal, there's a personality there. There's a beingness. You can smell it. You can... It's there, whereas on a piece of celluloid, a piece of film, you, can, you have to use your imagination. It's not quite the same for a small child. And I know when I was three, I think, I was taken to a zoo. I don't remember it, but apparently I was more expressive, more demonstrative, more excited than I'd ever been about anything in my life. Mm. But a zoo today, they, all the good zoos, uh, they also do a lot of conservation in the wild for the animals. And, you know, when you think of what the lot of so many animals in the wild is, people have this crazy idea that to be wild is freedom, is wonderful, it makes you happy. It doesn't. Mostly it doesn't. It's a very tough life, getting tougher. So a good zoo can do good for everybody. Right. You had some unbelievable experiences with uh, chimpanzees, and some of them are documented uh, on film. And we saw this clip. I think many people have seen it already, but still, it's too good not to show. This is one of the chimpanzees that was released in 2013, Wunda, in Congo. Let's have a look. I never saw this chimpanzee until this one day. Oh, yeah. Here we go. This is a really exciting moment for me. 
uh, here in here is Wunda. And she nearly died, but uh, thanks to Rebecca, she, she came back from the dead almost. I mean, I saw her looking almost dead, but anyway, now she has a will to live. And here she is about to come out into this paradise. It was amazing. Everyone was crying. The guys were crying. They all said, how did she know? Our head guy said, how did that chimp know that this lady was responsible for everything? Of course, she didn't, but... Have you experienced this before? No. Hmm. Not at all. Is there an explanation, or...? It's up there somewhere. You believe in God? I believe in a great spiritual power. Yes, I do. I'm asking because um, there are actually two questions here. I wonder how long you will continue doing what you do. You are extremely energetic. And if you think that, um, that uh, it's possible to save what you like to be saved, uh, the natural environment for chimpanzees and other wildlife. Well, to answer the second one first, I shall do everything in my power to make as much of it happen. We shan't save it all. There's no way. We would be stupid to think we can save everything. But we are restoring as well as saving some of what's left. So we just have to carry on and do that and hope that something happens to the human nature that we change in time. And how long will I go on doing it? That's up there too, as long as I can. And I hope that you know, when I'm no longer able to physically travel around the way I do now, I hope that my mind stays okay and I can go on writing because I have so much to write and no time to write mm. anymore. The last question in the show is always, um, what is the best advice you can give to students here in the hall and people who are watching this at home? Well, I think I've given the students my best advice already and I really don't have any better advice that, than what my mother gave me. You know, that if you really want to do something, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of opportunity, and never give up. Jane Goodall. <laughs>